gather to the word of God. We have uh, come together, Lord, for the purpose of Bible study or an understanding of what is contained in the scriptures. And so we pray for the Holy Spirit to lead and direct. We also pray, Father, for total recall, that you would remember your promise of John 14, 26, to bring back all things to our remembrance whatsoever you have told us. And so, Lord, as we continue to build upon the foundation that has been laid, we pray that we would be guided by your spirit, that you would lead us along the way as we run to and fro in the word of God. Open up our hearts and minds to understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, before we actually delve into the uh, lesson tonight, I want to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to do tonight and then, uh, by God's grace, complete on, on Saturday. So we've covered Daniel chapter 2. We looked at the, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, uh, and even touched on the feet of iron and clay. And we were looking at the principle of repeat and enlarge, and we came to Daniel chapter 7 and saw so far that the different kingdoms of prophecy have been the same. But they start with the lion with eagle's wings, which represents Babylon. And then you, of course, had Medo-Persia is the bear with three ribs in its mouth. You had Greece that was the leopard with four heads and four wings. And then finally, this dragon beast with ten horns, a symbol of Rome. And we touched upon that last night. So what we're going to do tonight is actually get into the study of the little horn. The little horn contains, or I should say, takes up the bulk of the chapter of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, we mentioned last night how the focus is on Rome for the, for the bulk of the chapter, but specifically the little horn. So we're going to take time to study this tonight to get an understanding of who the little horn is. Now, um, as we do this, um, I'm going to start first with some very basic prophetic historical points. And once we have identified who the little horn is, then on Saturday, we're going to go back to the little horn after having unmasked the little horn and go through much Bible and spiritual principles as it relates to the work of the little horn. So tonight is going to be basically identifying who the little horn is, making sure we can do so in prophecy and in history, and then on Saturday going into the Word of God to see how the Word of God uh, really expounds and exposes uh, the work of the power known as the little horn, or as Daniel chapter 2 described it, the feet of iron and clay. And so uh, let's begin tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you so that you can follow along with me <clears throat> in our study. So we're starting with unmasking the little horn power, as I was saying, and we're going to be weighing the biblical and the historical evidence of doing so. We're going to try to be as... Uh, Brief as possible, like last night, we, you know, I, I try to keep it within an hour. I'm going to try to do the same thing this evening. <clears throat> so let's deal specifically with just, just Daniel chapter 7, uh, just the inter, kind of an introduction to Daniel 7, right? So we learned that Daniel 7, how it presents a profound vision that encompasses the rise and fall of the empires and the ultimate establishment of God's kingdom. Uh, this chapter introduces significant prophetic symbols, such as the four beasts, representing various kingdoms throughout history. Notably, it sets the stage for the emergence of the little horn, a figure central to the interpretation of biblical prophecy. Understanding Daniel 7 is crucial for grasping the implications of the little horn's actions and its opposition to God's law as highlighted in the vision. So uh, Daniel 7, uh, as, as its entire scope deals with the kingdoms of prophecy, and again, pinpoints the little horn, because the little horn, and really understanding who this little horn hit is, is, as it says, crucial to our understanding. Uh, there are various uh, names given to the little horn uh, power in the Bible. Uh, tonight, we're going to just talk about its rise uh, politically, historically, and then on Saturday, we'll deal with some of the uh, spiritual implications and how it affects you and I even today. So 
just looking at some of the symbols, some of the key symbols that we have touched on already. Uh, we've talked about in uh, the four winds. Uh, Pastor Chapman uh, broke that down for us, and we understand that the wind represents worldwide strife and warfare. The number four specifically deals with worldwide. Uh, the four winds of heaven, as noted in the scriptures, come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. So it denotes the entire world. And in the book of Daniel, those winds blew upon the great sea, and the sea of the waters in scripture symbolized peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues, as found in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, and other scriptures. And then we looked at the beasts, uh, the four beasts specifically, and Daniel chapter 7, verse 17 explains to us that the four beasts represent four kings or kingdoms that would arise. And you'll remember again, the first was Babylon, the second was Media Persia, the third was Greece, and the fourth was Rome, which we dealt with last night. Now, something that the Bible said very clear last night was that the little, uh, excuse me, not the little horn, but the fourth beast, uh, Roman power, was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. In other words, it was different than all the former powers. And the reason why it was different is because whereas Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece were monarchies, we find that the Roman kingdom uh, was a republic. It was a system that was for the people by the people. They would vote and put their presidents and rulers in place. They had a three-tiered governmental system. And then, of course, the power of Rome shifted. It changed in its prophetic history and in history as well. And it went from being a republic to an empire. So republicanism was imp um, uh, replaced by imperialism. And when that took place, there was the combination of church and state. Uh, there was a national religion that was upheld specifically by Constantine and others after him. And that changed the landscape of the, the area of Rome, the Roman Empire, but it also changed the landscape of Christianity as we know it. And we're feeling its effects today. Uh, we talked about the ten horns that were uh, arising out of the dragon beast Rome. We saw that the ten horns mentioned in Daniel 7 symbolized ten kings that would arise from the fourth beast. Uh, and then, of course, in verse 24, it describes how the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that would arise. Now, in Bible prophecy, kings represent kingdoms. Uh, in According to Daniel 7, verse 17, and of course, 23 to 24, uh, just paraphrasing, right? These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Uh, the fourth beast, which would be the fourth king, uh, would be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So kings representing kingdoms. And if kings represent kingdoms and those horns represent kings, then the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings or ten kingdoms. So this indicates that each horn represents a distinct kingdom that would arise out of Rome. Now, for the historical context, which we touched last night, we'll look at a little bit more uh, tonight. Uh, these 10 kings emerged between the years 476 and 490. Uh, and during this was during the fragmentation of the Western Roman Empire into various states. And of course, those each, each of those states represented a horn on the beast. So Going back to Daniel 2, I want to make sure that uh, we are all on the same page and you might, this might be the first night that you joined us. And so I want to bring you up to speed. So when we were looking in Daniel chapter 2, we learned that the head of gold represented Babylon and how uh, after Babylon was the chest and the arms of silver representing the kingdom of Media Persia. And then of course, Greece was the belly and the thighs of brass. And then we had the legs of iron representing Rome. And so those four metals represented the four kingdoms or the four beasts, as we saw in Daniel 7. But what was also touched on when we studied Daniel chapter 2 is when you get to the time period of the feet and the toes, the feet and the toes of Daniel 2 were a mixture of two things. They were a mixture of iron and they were a mixture of clay. And in our studies together, we learned that clay symbolizes the people of God. It symbolizes the church, church power or church craft. 
And then, of course, the iron uh, represents the power of the state or statecraft. And so mingled together, you would have the combination of church and state. Now, it's important to note that the iron continues all the way down to the toes. And so the iron of Rome is a continual force all the way to the end. And then, of course, you have that stone in the background you can see in that image there that's coming to destroy uh, the image and strike it upon its feet. And uh, that, of course, is a symbol of the kingdom of God. And so these earthly kingdoms from Babylon to the church state powers, uh, these would compose the powers of the earth before God sets up his eternal kingdom. Now, we want to identify who this church and state power is that arises directly after Rome. Uh, when we were looking in Daniel, the seventh chapter, uh, we know, of course, that the lion was Babylon, the bear was Medo Persia, Greece was the leopard, and Rome was the dragon. And uh, Bible prophecy specifically focuses on the power of Rome. It spends more time on, uh, with Rome than on any of the other kingdoms. And this great dragon beast Rome, uh, the Bible says in Daniel 7, verse 7, you can see that on your screen, but I really encourage you to uh, get into the word of God, uh, have your Bible with you and turn to the scriptures. Don't just look on the screen. But in Daniel, the seventh chapter and the seventh verse, it says, after this, I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth and devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. And we covered this, of course, last night. But as we were looking at this dragon beast and the 10 horns that come up out of this beast, and we, rep we understand that this beast represents Rome, and those 10 horns represent the divided kingdoms of Rome, Bible prophecy goes a step further in which we're going to focus on tonight. And that is in verse eight. In Daniel chapter seven and verse eight, it describes that out of the fourth beast, as he was considering the horns, as Daniel was looking at the horns, uh, behold, there came up um, among them another little horn uh, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. I want to emphasize a few things uh, today. When you look at this latter, the, the latter portion of the verse, which we're going to explain all of this, just not necessarily tonight. Uh, hope you uh, join us on Saturday for the remainder of our study. But if you look what it says here, that in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, I want you to notice that it does not say in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. In other words, it's not emphasizing an individual. Remember, the horns that rise up are a symbol of kingdoms. They're a symbol of nations. They're a symbol of powers. So this is not referring to an individual, all right? The eyes of man is a prophetic symbol that we'll delve into on Saturday. Uh, but he has the, it, it has the eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth that speaks great things. And so the focus now goes from Rome uh, uh, from Rome, uh, 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 the Republic of Rome, to Rome, Imperial Rome, and then Rome, of course, changes forms. And so this little horn power rises up. Now, uh, again, just a, a quick review. Uh, when we talk about the ten horns, remember the power of Rome was divided. There was an initial division with Rome. Rome has a lot of different prophetic characteristics. And one of the characteristics is that it's a divided kingdom or it's a kingdom that divides. And initially it was divided in the year 330 by the emperor Constantine. Constantine uh, left the city of Rome in, in Italy and went to uh, Turkey and set up what was dedicated as Constantinople, which today is Istanbul. And Eastern Rome began to be the new capital of the Roman kingdom, which did not help Rome at all, because in Bible prophecy, as well as denoted in history, any time the power of Rome is removed from the city of Rome, it loses its power. And we'll see how that plays out uh, historically. So when Constantine shifted the kingdom or divided it to east and west, thinking to increase power, increase authority, what really happened is it brought the beginning of its disintegration. 
Uh, he split it up a, another time before his death between his three sons. And then, of course, there was further division that is described in Daniel 7, verse 24, as the arising of these ten horns. And, of course, that, again, was the kingdoms that rose between 476 and 490. Now, what causes kingdoms to rise? Uh, we talked about also any time you have a kingdom that is taken over uh, by another kingdom, the crown is passed, right? From Babylon, it goes to Medo-Persia. From Medo-Persia, it goes to Greece. From Greece, it goes to Rome. And then there were powers. There were different uh, 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 hordes that came and began to fight the Roman Empire and caused its division, caused its disintegration. And instead of the crown passing to them, Rome instead shifts again and changes one more time. In Daniel 2, remember, it was a shift from all iron now to a mixture of iron and clay. And so we're going to get into how these things took place historically. So on your screen here, you see a picture. Uh, and this is just a picture of the Roman army fighting what they termed as barbarian hordes, right? So these various uh, barbarian nations came and began to fight against the Roman power. Uh, they didn't want to be subjugated by Rome. They didn't like Roman rule, especially in the imperial rule. The people rebelled. And so they began fighting and they were overcoming the Roman power. Now, the battles uh, between the Roman armies and the barbarian hordes, this is what brought Rome to its knees and ultimately division, uh, its division into 10 kingdoms. And there you have on your screen, kind of a, a map of the 10 divisions of the Western Roman Empire. And the different barbarian nations took a piece of what used to be one whole Roman Empire in the West. Of course, you have the Anglo-Saxons and the Franks, the Alamanni, the Burgundians, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Hurali, the Sueve, the Visigoths, and the Vandals. These 10 uh, uh, barbarian tribal nations they took over the Western Roman Empire. Now, today, <clears throat> we don't necessarily uh, refer to these areas by that name. The Anglo-Saxons, for an example, is Great Britain, and the Franks is France, the Alemanni is Germany, and Hurali would be Italy, and so on and so forth. Vandals would be Northern Africa. All of this was a part of the Roman Empire. And so now it is divided into these 10 various horns, or 10 various kingdoms. But in the Bible, and I want you to remember this, right? So in Daniel chapter 7, uh, going back to verses 7 and 8, let's, let's recall this. It says, behold, there was a fourth beast. That fourth beast was Rome. It had great iron teeth, taking us back to the connection between the iron legs of Daniel 2. It had 10 horns, the 10 nations that you see before you in its division. And as Daniel was considering the 10 horns, Behold, there came up among them another little horn. So I want to emphasize the fact that whoever this little horn power is, it comes up among these 10 divided kingdoms of Western Rome. Uh, then, of course, we have verses 23 and 24 of Daniel. And it says the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another, that another horn, shall arise after them. So whereas we understood that the little horn rises among the ten nations that we see on the screen, it also arises after them. So the 10 uh, kingdoms were already established, and we've already talked about historically, they were already established uh, specifically by the year 490. And so therefore, whoever this little horn power is, not only does it arise in what we would consider the European nations today, not only does it arise in that area, but it would arise after these 10 kingdoms were already established. So historically, it places us from the year 490 or onward, right? And, you know, just to be very clear, uh, we've already studied 
in Daniel chapter two, that you go from the legs of iron, which is the pot time period of, of the Roman empire into a mixture of iron and clay, which is a time of church and state. We understood that the state power was represented by the iron, the clay was represented by the, or the, the clay represents the church and the state power that's there is still Roman. So we're looking for a power that is a church that is mixed with the Roman state. And there's really only one in history that arose after the year 490 in the areas of Europe that is a church and state combined power. It is a Roman church and state combined power, and there's only one that can fit that, and that is the Roman papacy. And the Roman papacy, of course, arose in Italy. Uh, specifically, excuse me, specifically here, if you look at the in the upper uh, left corner, you have a, a, a symbol or I guess you can say a maps view of the boot of Italy. And of course, pinpointed, you have the city of Rome. And in the city of Rome, you have a smaller city that's called Vatican City. And Vatican City is the central seat of the Roman papacy. Uh, the city of Rome and that area specifically, the Vatican City, a, a city built on seven hills. Uh, this was a very uh, uh, important place for the Roman Empire before Constantine moved to Constantinople in Turkey. Uh, and when he vacated this area, the Roman bishops uh, took force or took the throne. And we'll look at that as well together. So when we're talking about the Roman papacy, all right, just to make it very clear, uh, the papacy is the office and the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome who presides over the Holy See. Now the Holy See is the central government of the Roman Catholic Church. And I want you to notice the language that's being used. Uh, incidentally, this is actually a direct definition of the papacy. You'll notice that the church has a central government. And we're going to see that the central government of the Roman church is actually a global recognized judicial system. So again, when we're talking about the papacy, we're not just talking about the church power the Ro or Roman Catholicism uh, as a church, but we're talking about Roman Catholicism as a church and state power. People have to understand that it's much more than just a church. It is a recognized state uh, in, in global politics. Uh, I'm going to be quoting from, this is actually from state.gov. So if you did www.state.gov and you looked at how, um, and it's a, it's a United States website, and you look at how the United States views the Roman papacy, this is taken directly from their website. And I'll give you the reference um, at the end here. <clears throat> it says, the Holy See, incidentally, uh, the phrase the Holy See, the word see comes from the Latin, which meaning seat. So the Holy See or the Holy Seat is a universal government of the Catholic Church and operates from Vatican City State, a sovereign, independent territory. Listen, the Pope is the ruler of both Vatican City State and the Holy See. So the Pope is a great bridge between church and state. He is the one that brings it all together. The Holy See, as the supreme body of government of the Catholic Church, is a sovereign judicial entity under international law. And again, that's taken from state.gov, the article U.S. Relations with the Holy See. So the United States recognizes the, uh, the papacy, uh, recognizes the, uh, the Holy See, not just the uh, not just the state portion, but also the church portion and brought together, it is recognized as a sovereign judicial entity under international law. The papacy, the Holy See, uh, has its own flag and prints its own money. Uh, anytime you have the gathering of nations like the uh, the United Nations or any type of uh, you know uh, international gathering of the powers of the world, uh, whether it even be... Um, you know, different events where people are bringing their flags and they're, they're, they're marching down, down the aisle representing all the different nations of the world. Pay close attention next time. The next time you'll see the flag of the Roman papacy and they're called the Holy See and everybody cheers. It is a recognized state church entity in the world. Now, this is very important. 
Because when we go through Bible prophecy, you go from kingdoms that are specifically state-focused or civil power, and then Rome, the power that changes, shifts from the republic to the imperial system, then it shifts into a combination of church and state. The ecclesiastical power takes the leading role. And uh, we'll see how that takes place in history. So let's just review some of the things that we've we've looked at briefly. Uh, we talked about how the little horn would emerge from Rome. The Bible says that. And because Rome was the fourth beast. And so we saw that the little horn would emerge from the fourth beast, which is Rome. And we see that, of course, the Roman papacy comes from Rome. Uh, number two, we saw that it's a religious power combined with the authority of the Roman state. And uh, that should be a big giveaway there, especially when you're studying Daniel chapter two and you're seeing uh, the church mixed with the Roman state. There's, there's only one, there's literally only one entity that can fulfill this. And this is the Roman papacy. All right. So it is the little horn power of Daniel seven. Now, in order for the little horn to come into power, in order for it to gain authority, the Bible says that it has to uproot three kingdoms. So in Daniel 7, verse 24, and in Daniel 7, verse 28, let's read what it says. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So this little horn that rose among those 10 nations, or those 10 divided nations of Western Europe or the Western Roman Empire, the little horn power known as the papacy, in order for it to come into power or to gain its ascendancy, it has to remove, pluck up three horns or three of the former kingdoms. In Daniel 7, verse 24, it says the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. All right, so here we have again, <clears throat> a representation of the removal or subjection or subjugation rather of three kings or three kingdoms. Now, uh, you, you may have noticed this here in verse 24, just like Rome itself, how it was diverse than all the beasts before it, this little horn power is diverse from the first horns before it, right? So it's different than the other 10 horns. And we'll talk about some of the differences tonight. What makes the Roman papal horn different than the other 10 horns that arose out of Rome? We'll talk about that also. So we're gonna get into this removal or plucking up, as the Bible puts it, of these three kings, these three horns. <clears throat> now, when we're talking about the prophecy, of the little horn. Uh, the little horn arises among the 10 horns by plucking up three of the kingdoms as stated in Daniel 7 verse 8, right? Uh, and just again, there came up among them another little horn before, there were who, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Now we're going to see that plucking up by the roots indicates destruction and dominance. And this will showcase the little horn's rise. So let's look at biblical proof. How do we know that the plucking up is a symbol of, of course, destruction and ultimate dominance. Look at two texts. There on your screen, you have Jeremiah 31, 28, and Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 3. And in these scriptures, notice, notice the, the, the contrasts and the comparisons that are in these verses. I really like these verses for this, for this purpose. It shows contrast and comparison. So in Jeremiah 31, verse 28, the Bible says, and it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and break to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. So here the Lord is talking about uh, uh, the you know uh, removal of people. And the Bible says that he's going to build and plant them, uh, but also he was going to pluck up break down, throw down, destroy, and afflict. So the building and the planting is contrasted again with the plucking up, breaking down, throwing down, destroying, and affliction. And those five uh, uh, you know, negative phrases or negative terms are comparisons, right? To pluck up 
you're going to see is the same as to break down. It's the same as to throw down. It's the same to, as to destroy. It's the same as to afflict. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we have some more comparisons and contrasts. Notice Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 3. This is a well-known area of scripture. Uh, many of you, uh, even if you've never even opened the Bible before, you've heard uh, some of these phrases, right? To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. That's a common saying, and many people don't even know it's from the Bible, that there's a time for everything. There's a, there is, it says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Contrasts, right? A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Contrast. A time to kill and a time to heal. Contrast. A time to break down and a time to build up. Again, contrast. So you have these contrasts of these different themes here. But then also you can break them up down or put them in a columns for comparison, right? Uh, to be born is compared to being planted. It's compared to being healed. It's compared to being built up. Whereas dying is compared to a time to kill and a time to break down and also a time to pluck up. So when we look at these negative phrases as they are compared uh, in the scriptures, we understand that when the Bible says that this little horn was going to pluck up three of the first horns, that it means it was going to destroy, to break down, to, to afflict them, to destroy them, to, to kill them. Now, the Bible goes even further and says they were to be plucked up by the roots. Now, all of us understand that if I want to kill a plant or kill a tree, you don't just cut the tree down. You don't cut its branches or cut, even, even chop it down. That won't necessarily kill the tree. If the roots are in the ground, it can come back. If I want to pluck weeds, I don't just take a weed whacker and cut the top of the weeds off uh, because they will grow back extremely fast. But if I want to take them up so that they don't grow in at least that particular weed, you pull it up by the roots. So when the Bible says that the little horn was going to take three of the first kingdoms and pluck them up by the roots, not only are these kingdoms being destroyed, but they are being utterly wasted to where they do not rise again in history. Uh, you can even say genocide was practiced in the arising of the little horn power, the, the, the Roman papal see. Uh, the papacy was when it, in, in its rise, uh, genocide was used in order for it to get into power. Now, there's some questions that we want to ask ourselves. Uh, ourselves. I like to ask questions when I'm studying the Bible. If I see something there, we know that we started with 10 horns. We know that there's a starting with 10 horns. Three of them are uprooted, so that leaves seven. So the question is, why did only three of the horns get uprooted? Why not uproot all of them? And then if only three are uprooted, what happens to the other seven, right? What happens to these horns? Well, let's see. Now, there's this is a this, this could be a long quote. I'm not going to go through all of, read all of the history here, uh, but it's important. Certain portions are very important for us. And this is actually a quotation of numerous historians. Gibbon is being uh, uh, quoted here. Uh, Eliot is being quoted here and others. Now, uh, the title slide is quid pro quo. In other words, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. A favor for a favor, right? And what was happening here is during the time where you have the uh, 10 kingdoms rising to power, uh, there was all type of fighting going on. Of course, you know, nations want to enlarge their borders. And so there were fightings going on even amongst those 10. And specifically, there were three of these horns that were a, a problem. They were problematic. And in history, it's very interesting, uh, the historians refer to them as Aryan. Now, we're not talking about Aryan like Aryan nation, right? We're talking about the followers of Arius. Uh, the, those who are considered Aryan or the followers of Arius, they had some very specific beliefs uh, that were vastly different than the Catholic Church that had been established. And there were a few different things 
that made them a very much thorn in the flesh for the uh, Catholic Church at the time. Now, one of those beliefs was the day of worship. Uh, we'll see in just a moment uh, uh, um, how that was brought out in history. So uh, the day of worship for the Catholics was different than the day of worship for the Arians. The Arians uh, stuck to uh, what they saw in the scriptures, whereas the Catholics, as we'll see together, uh, went by tradition. Then there was the understanding of, of the Godhead, or, or excuse me, not the Godhead. Uh, they, it was referred to as the Trinity. Uh, now, if you're a Bible student, you'll notice that the word Trinity is never found in the scriptures. The Godhead is, and the way that the Godhead in the Bible is described is vastly different than the way that many understand the Trinity to be, especially the Roman Catholic Trinity. And so these were various issues um, that were brought about. And instead of arguing uh, in a pulpit or having a Bible study, they went to war over these things, as many times that happened in ancient medieval history. And even today, when people have different ideologies and beliefs, uh, we go to war, right? And so this is what happened between the Arians uh, and uh, uh, the Arian king in Italy was fighting with the Catholics. Uh, you have the Arian Vandals in North Africa, according to Gibbon. And then Eliot speaks of the Vandal King, um, not only uh, the Vandal King, but also he was uh, uh, persecuting the Catholics in Sardinia and uh, Corsica under the Roman Episcopate, Episcopate and uh, in Africa as well. And I want to just read this highlighted portion because it brings some important history out in the establishment of the Little Horn. So remember, Rome divided into two. It went from the east or it divided into east and west. Now, even though Western Rome had fallen and given place to the papacy now, you still had uh, Rome, the emperor, empire of Rome in the east. And Emperor Justinian, uh, in the year 533, he enters into this uh, Vandal and Gothic war. Again, war with the Vandals and the Goths, uh, which were two of the horns. And so in order to secure, as it says, influence of the Pope and the Catholic party, he issued that memorable decree, which was to constitute the Pope as the head of all the churches, and from the carrying out of which in 538, the period of papal supremacy is to be dated. And we'll look at another uh, historical point uh, with that as well, and what the uh, decree of Justinian was that went forward. Uh, but jumping down, this is de Beignet's book on the Reformation. Uh, he says, princes whom these stormy times often shook upon their thrones offered their protection if Rome would in its turn support them. So notice what's happening. So remember, there's various kingdoms now that are established, and there's a few of them who are problematic. They were so problematic that it caused many of the king, kingdoms and their, their kings to shake in their boots. And so they reach out to Rome. Now, remember, when we're talking Rome now and Rome in history here, not just the kingdom of Rome as a whole, but specifically Rome in the West that is now dominated by the Catholic Church. And so they reach out to Rome for protection. And you might say, well, what protection can a church give to a state? Well, Justinian made a decree that not only was the Pope the head of all the holy churches, but also the corrector of heretics. And so now the papacy is able to not only uh, uh, secure leadership in what was considered the correct church of the empire, but they also now have uh, backing to be able to persecute or to bring uh, uh, justice, as they would see it, against those who disagreed with their views. And so they have power. And these other nations were a lot smaller in power, and they reach out to the church for help. And so they said, listen, we'll give you our power, we'll give you our sword to protect you, if in turn you'll support us. Here's where the quid pro quo comes in. They conceded to her spiritual authority provided she would make a return in secular power. So listen, we'll bow down and concede to Catholicism if you give us secular power. 
They were lavish of the souls of men in the hope that she would aid them against their enemies. The power of the hierarchy, which was ascending, in other words, the power of the papacy as it's ascending, and the imperial power of Rome, which was declining, leaned thus one upon the other. And by this alliance, church and state, accelerated their twofold destiny. Rome could not lose by it. In other words, this aided the Roman papacy and not the others, right? And so, uh, you know, when it comes to the power of the papacy, and I'll just read this one last uh, highlighted portion, uh, no decree of this nature could be carried into effect until the Aryan horns, which stood in its way, it being the, the little horn, were plucked up. The Vandals fell before the victorious arms of Belisarius in 534, and the Goths, retiring, left him undisputed possession of Rome in 538. And so we have the removal of the Aryan horns, those three horns that were plucked up by the roots. You have the Hurali in AD 493. You have the Vandals in AD 534. And then, of course, you have the Ostrogoths or the Goths in the West uh, in AD 538. This is all history. This is all verifiable. And this is what allowed now the papacy undisputed rise in power and authority. Now, some of the differences between the little horn and those three horns, right? What are the differences uh, between these Aryan horns? Uh, I'm not going to read these even, uh, but these are historians. You hear you have uh, Sozman in his uh, Church History Book 7 and identifies that the Arians were keepers of the seventh day Sabbath, which was different than the Roman Catholicism day of worship, which was Sunday, the first day of the week. Uh, here you have Church History Book 6. Again, that's describing as a different historian, uh, showing that the Arians, again, were Saturday keepers or Sabbath keepers. And then also Book 5, Chapter 22, describing the Arians once again as Sabbath keepers. And this is what led to great conflict, all right, between the Roman church and the Arian horns. They had to go. You cannot contest my beliefs. This is what the Roman papacy was saying. This is what the little horn believed. And because now they are given the ability to correct or punish heretics, they can go to war. And this is exactly what they did. So remember, you have the 10 horns, Three had to be uprooted, so it left seven. Those seven horns, they actually become the military might and power behind the little horn, and they were fighting on her behalf. In history, the Franks were first. France was the very first one. And even still today, and you can look this up, they're referred to as sometimes the eldest son, but more often the eldest daughter of the Catholic Church. They were the first to concede. Prior to this, all 10 were considered pagan. They were not Christian. Uh, even the Arians who were following some of the Bible's principles were really not Christian themselves. Uh, so they were considered pagan. And so they converted now to Catholicism, not the Arians, they were uprooted. But the other seven European kingdoms, they converted to Catholicism. Uh, and um, became the military backing behind the papacy. So we talked about the little horn, horn emerging from Rome, rising from, uh, from the Roman kingdom, uh, and we see the Roman papacy does that. We saw that it's a religious power combined with the authority of the Roman state. We, we saw that's the very definition, right, of the papacy. And then now we saw that it would eliminate three of the divided kingdoms of Western Roman of the Western Roman Empire to establish its authority. And historically, that's exactly what took place. So again, prophecy is history in advance. And so what God was saying would happen exactly took place uh, that way in history. Now, I want to look in just the last few moments that we have together uh, at this particular statement. Again, this is, we're just gonna look at the highlighted portions, but this is about how the papacy gained power. It goes into that Justinian code where Justinian was, uh, you know, placing the, uh, uh, the papacy, the Roman papacy as the head of the churches, as well as the corrector of heretics. And uh, the highlighted portion says, this code, however, 
did not become legally propagated and enacted on the ground until the siege of Rome was lifted in 538. That date is crucial. Uh, we're going to see this again and again and again in our study, specifically as we identify some things on Saturday. So that code could not really go into effect until 538. Justinian's general, Belisarius, had entered Rome unopposed at the end of 536, but shortly thereafter, the Ostrogoths came and laid siege to Rome. After about a year, the siege was broken, and Belisarius had control of Rome and its environs. It was then that the provisions of the code elevating the papacy could actually be implemented by Belisarius beyond the borders of Rome itself. So 538, now the papacy can rise to power. Now the Justinian Code can go into effect. Now her, her power is, is, is really uncontested because you have those seven European uh, kingdoms uh, convert to the Catholicism. And then, you, of course, you have the removal of those Aryan horns. Now, the, Ostrogoth, the Ostrogothic War really didn't end until 553 when they were destroyed. But we have to understand that, um, you know, when it's talking about plucking up, this was not just an instantaneous act. Um, this is a process, right? You can't just remove a kingdom in one day. Uh, and so they have, there's a process of removing these horns. But in 538, when the Ostrogoths left the city of Rome, now Justinian's code can go into effect. 538 is the marker, even though the Ostrogoths were not fully uprooted until 553. And so 538, right, we're, we're coming to the end now. Two slides, this one and another one. 538 marks the, 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 the beginning of papal authority, right? Uh, papal authority now begins to take over the Roman kingdom, and the church is the dominating power over the nation. And this is a point that is extremely important. When we look in Bible prophecy, even though Daniel 2 describes a mixture of church and state, it doesn't emphasize really uh, who's in control. Daniel 7 introduces biblical principles that you are uh, that we are expose or uncover in in history. So prophecy again is uncovered in history and history shows that it's the church that is leading the state. And anytime you see that in history, a combination of church and state, the church is always the one that's the dominating power and uses the state to further her own dogmas. This is exactly what the papacy was. And this is the time period in history where here's some illustrations. Now, these are old illustrations. All right. Here you have on the left, this is the time period where you would have the popes standing on the necks of emperors. All right. So here's, uh, you know, Pope Alexander, and he's standing on the neck of Frederick the emperor. And then on the right, you have the emperor kissing the pope's feet. Right. So the pope is now the dominant force. The Roman papacy is now the dominant force. Rome is still in power. Rome is still ruling the world. Only now it's no longer republic. It is no longer imperial Rome. It is what we call papal Rome. And the church takes the ascendancy. Now, understanding this, understanding that the little horn is the Roman papacy, the combination of iron and clay, the church and the state. Once we start going through Bible prophecy and identifying what the eyes like the eyes of man and the mouth that speaks great things, um, once we start looking at these things, we'll see that this is very much spiritual language, very much the things that only a church power could do. And when we understand that, then it really opens up for us the understanding of the role of the little horn. And so I pray that you, you know, come back on Sabbath, on Saturday, and that you uh, join us again as we continue to go through the Word of God. Uh, it's going to be a lot more scripture on Saturday, and we will show how scripture is fulfilled in history or prophecy is fulfilled in history. But I am confident that the word of God is so clear
that it will not be misunderstood. I look forward to you joining us. I look forward to continuously uh, unmasking or unrolling the mask of the papacy and identifying why God even makes it a point in the Bible to do so. You'll see how it's going to greatly affect and affect the entire world. With that, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the time that we have spent in your word. We're thankful, dear God, that uh, history has been uh, recorded for us in such uh, a, a clear way where we can look back and see that your word has been fulfilled. And Father, we are encouraged because there is a principle, and that is the principle of the scriptures is that you tell us before things come to pass so that when it is come to pass, we might believe. And Father, we believe tonight. We see that what was written uh, way before, well in advance to the rising of these various in, uh, empires and nations, uh, we see that they were fulfilled exactly as scripture had said. They were fulfilled in history. Uh, Father, this lets us know that your word is true, that your word cannot be uh, convoluted, that your word is, is crystal clear. I pray, Father, that we would spend the time in understanding that we might indeed be set free from the bondage of sin. Watch over us and keep us. And while we are absent one from another, while we have these few days break until we come back Saturday at noon for the remainder uh, of this lesson, I pray, Lord, that we would take the time to go back over our notes, to maybe even review the, the, the recording so that we can be settled in the truth, immovable, both uh, in intellectually as well as spiritually. This I pray for all of those under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. I look forward to seeing you on Saturday at noon as we continue in our study of unmasking the little horn. God bless. <laughs>